Brambro back with some Grand Tactician Civil War, our CSA campaign in the 1.06 beta. And there's quite a bit to talk about. In the last episode, uh, had run into, I think, into January, and uh, the Union had uh, kind of quieted down for the winter, so I have run time quite a bit into the future. We're now in uh, mid-March, winter weather will be easing up pretty soon, and the campaign season is going to open. And in addition to that, we'll find out just how bad this um, contract expiration thing is, because that's going to happen in just a few weeks now, in April. So, what have I been doing off camera during the intervening three months? Well, eh, maybe two and a half months. Well, first things first, I have recruited a whole bunch of soldiers. <laughs> both uh, east and west, and the overall size of the military is up above 200k now. However, if you look down there toward the bottom, uh, estimated loss of manpower through contract expiration within the next three months is 64k. So as I mentioned, had to do a ton of recruiting just to hopefully stay right around the same level where we were. If, and again, it's a big if, if that reenlistment ratio number is correct. Which, you can see, last I talked about it, in January, it was at 10%. It is now down to 3%. And also, as mentioned before, there's no state support reason for that. Um, still plenty of support in the vast majority of Confederate states. Uh, state support is increasing in Kentucky. We had gotten down as low as 62%, and it's back up to 68 So the measures we've taken, trying to bring that Kentucky state support back up, some of it was infrastructure, some of it, some of it was just establishing firmer control over formerly union-owned areas. Um, so, so that is having an effect. Kentucky's going in the right direction. And one thing that I had forgotten about that could very well have been a factor for each individual IIP is fine, Maysville. Uh, okay, that was not going to work. Well, it's making a liar out of me. I, I guess we've had control of these long enough where it's no longer in effect. But when an IIP has been has recently transferred ownership, maybe this one will have it from Evansville. No, there will be a little note right here saying this IIP was recently occupied and is recovering its uh, transport capacity, perhaps. Any. Anyway, IIPs lose a bit of their oomph economically when they've recently changed hands. And so even though we were clearing out uh, union control in much of Kentucky, those IIPs needed time to kind of rebuild. That may very well have been a factor in the state support and in the supply situation overall also. Um, so that's good news on state support. The bad news on state support is Virginia's dropping. Uh, they were up in the 90s uh, going into the winter, and Virginia's down to 82%. And I think that is probably primarily because the Union still controls Wheeling and Grafton, and therefore a few other IIPs in Western Virginia. And they've probably got, you know, occupied territory uh, projects going, perhaps. Because we don't see all their projects, you know, the uh, these guys here. 
the occupation administration and the suppressed population, they may have some of these enacted, which could be uh, driving down support right in this area. So as soon as the winter's over with, and we get and we have this manpower thing figured out, uh, retaking Grafton and Wheeling, I think, kind of need to be toward the top of the priority list. Okay. Well, while I'm still talking about troops, let me put, turn this uh, overlay off. And we'll just look at the first core as an example. So here's one of the original campaign start units that started the campaign on 12-month contracts. They have one month left for April, as we've been talking about. So what I intend to do, I haven't done it yet, what I intend to do is I want to see how many men they really lose because I'm not convinced this reenlistment ratio number is correct. But as a precaution, I don't know what happens to these weapons, okay? So this brigade has grown to 2850. Now, regardless of what the reenlistment ratio is, whether it's 50% or 3%, you know, even if things are kind of, quote, normal, unquote, this brigade is going to drop to at least half strength, even if it doesn't evaporate. <laughs> um, what happens to those Mississippi rifles? I don't know. Logically, they would just go back into the weapons pool. However, they may not. Um, units, you know, replacements gradually trickle in and, and, and brigades fill up, well, all the units fill up over time with an increasing flow of replacements from their home states. You know, you can recruit a medium brigade. It won't stay medium. If it's left alone long enough, it will become a large brigade. And same with the smalls. As they gradually grow like that they stay with their weapon and their growth is as far as I've been able to tell is not hampered right they're not those extra guys trickling in are not further drawing on Mississippi rifles in the armory so it's kind of a way to get quote, free weapons, unquote. Um, of course, it takes a very long time to do that, and it assumes that the unit doesn't take casualties, etc., etc., etc. But weapons do kind of materialize out of thin air that way. Because of that, I'm not convinced that these weapons will go back into the armory. Because there is a way that weapons can kind of materialize out of thin air by the growth of a brigade. Therefore, there might be a way that they disappear into thin air <laughs> by the contraction of a brigade. So, uh, here soon, and I'm not going to go through and show all the clicking. I'll do, that. I'll do it off camera. But I am going to remove decent weapons from every 12, you know, Every one of these units that is close to expiration, which is almost all of them in this army, I'm going to go back through and remove the rifles and give them mixed uh, muskets or maybe Springfields. And then when they do actually expire, we'll take a look in the armory and see if that number bumps up a lot. And meanwhile, we will have ensured instead of rolling the dice, uh, that we keep Mississippi's and Springfield rifle muskets. Okay. Um, so that's where we are with troops. I have... <clears throat> I have spent a lot of money <laughs> while off camera. Enough that we've actually dropped to BBB plus credit rating. Uh, before, I was hovering between A and A-, minus, back and forth, back and forth. Now, I'm 
bouncing back and forth between A- and BBB+. So, you know, there there is a limit on spending, and I've come a lot closer to it. Um, what have I spent that money on? Well, first, I have bought a bunch of weapons. Just going down the list here. Uh, I did get to and take the medium range carbine uh, project. And I have bought a whole uh, 10,000 each of Joslin's, Maynard's, and Merrill carbines. That should be enough not only to equip our current cavalry, but enough to to pretty much equip all our cavalry for the rest of the campaign. I hope. So the you know, it's a big buy. I may have bought too much, but basically my thought was get it all now and not have to worry about it in the future. So basically there's enough here for about four to five, depending on their size. Four to five brigades of cavalry of each type. The Maynards are the best, but I, w I got some of all three so that I could kind of spread it out and they would be delivered more quickly. And, and I just did this just a couple weeks ago in game, so uh, still got about two months for all these to show up. Next. As far as I know, there is no way by any project to ever get any Hall Rifles. I do have a few howitzers just because I changed out some guns and a couple of uh, battalions. I haven't bought any, any more. So this is a little interesting. Uh, as seen in the last episode, I went for the Confederate Rifles um, project and ordered some. And that was, that was on screen in the last episode. What I didn't realize, though, there is a cavalry weapon that comes with that same project, and that's this Richmond Carbine. I, I haven't bought any, I, but I didn't even know these existed. And they're somewhat interesting in that... Now, they're muzzle loading. They are not breech loaders. Okay, three rounds per minute. But they come with 375 yards. That's pretty nice for cavalry. I'm not doing this, but I don't think it would be unreasonable if you're if someone is, is really trying to go through the uh, and, and play the economy in such a way as to really minimize the number of weapons projects so that you can use more military subsidies for other uses like logistics reform, trade warfare, stuff like that. It would probably not be uh, ridiculous to just go with the one Confederate rifle project and get both infantry and cavalry weapons out of that. It's just a thought. I'm not buying these, but I just didn't even know that that weapon came with that project, and I thought that was interesting. Uh, okay. We got our James rifles that we had ordered before. It was a fairly small order. I put some of them out to a couple battalions, but I have also ordered more. And like I was saying before, just going whole hog. I'm, I'm just settling on this as the rifle <laughs> that we're going to go with, and I ordered... 256 of them. <laughs> and they're about a two and a half months away. So there you have it. We're going to have a lot of rifled artillery soon, even if it's just James's. They're not bad. Uh, the big, I lost, uh, the big 50,000 uh, Springfield rifle muskets, uh, they showed up. I have already sent most of them out to brigades. 24 and 36 month brigades and I ordered another batch of 25,000 and they'll be here in about a month 
Uh, still waiting on our order of Fayettevilles and Richmonds. Uh, they, they're, they're less than three weeks away. So here's another 20,000 rifles here. Okay, a lot of weapons coming. More than I need right now. And again, the idea is once all this stuff arrives, we should have plenty of weapons for the rest of the campaign. I may have overbought, but I'd rather overbuy than underbuy. Uh, those are the six pounders. We got a few Napoleons in yet uh, from an initial order. I've ordered some more of those. And our initial order of uh, 128 iron Napoleons has already arrived. So, same thing. We're going to have plenty of smooth bores other than six pounder default field guns. Because I like about a kind of half and a half uh, distribution of these in the. Uh, and the cores. You know, some rifles for kind of a grand battery in the artillery division, and then the, some smooth bores for closer support to the infantry canister. Okay, so a lot of weapons coming. That's enough on that. And I probably spent, I don't know if I spent a hundred million, but it, it had to be 70 or 80 million on all that. What else have I done? I've built some buildings. Uh, we had already been kind of pursuing the put markets everywhere strategy in a lot of places, and I have done more of that. Um, not not tons and tons more, but uh, there's a few building right now. But one thing I was thinking is, so they improve infrastructure. Does that that should include river and sea transport? Now, I didn't do anything with the ports. I, I didn't put any more markets there. But I did uh, sprinkle some more markets kind of near every little crap port along the Mississippi. And the idea was not really to boost those ports per se in terms of their individual trade, but to increase river transport capacity. And yeah, it, that bumped it up pretty good. Uh, we were down in the 80s, and I've bumped the river transport capacity up to 114. So I think that had the desired effect. Look at the market heat map. Yeah, there's one here at Baton Rouge. There's one here at Lake Providence, one at Greenville. Kind of along in here. Those weren't there before. And also, somehow I had missed putting a market at Atlanta. I so plopped one there. I think there's a couple others here and there on the map. I built a couple more news agencies up along the Ohio. One at Louisville and one at, uh, what is this, Covington. To just further cement in our intelligence picture. You keep track of all these little Union armies running around up in here. And, you know, the Intel heat map is looking pretty decent. Um, some time ago, a few episodes ago, I mentioned uh, that I had built, started building just some little, the cheapest possible ships there were, uh, gunboats just to make a bunch of little squadrons to spread along the rivers and uh, help provide eyes. So that's been done. And so I've got, I don't know, 10 or 11 of these little gunboats just kind of sprinkled along the rivers, further improving the intelligence picture and spotting stuff that comes toward Evansville. Uh, I've got one up here pretty close to St. Louis. There is a fairly... There's a 9-ship, 49-gun Union Squadron um, up here right at St. Louis. Can't go farther than that. In blockade mode, uh, I don't see what good that does because I don't think that there is a Confederate river port anywhere in that guy's uh, radius, but okay. Okay. 
I am thinking, however, it's haven't started building ships for it yet, or or retasking ships for it. At some point, may want some kind of a river combat squadron to go up here and beat that guy up if we ever do decide to go into Missouri. Uh, have built a couple of forts. This uh, this fort now has been built at Winchester and it's got a pretty good uh, garrison. 2,600 men. Okay, so that long-term goal has finally been accomplished. And then I have also built forts at Louisville and uh, Covington. Covington slash Cincinnati. This is really kind of one big 17-point city. Uh, or can be thought of that way. And I did exercise enough discipline to hold off on any usage of industrial subsidies and have managed to build a factory <laughs> completely with subsidies, not spending uh, budget money. So there's a factory almost complete and this was kind of, a, you know, it's on a railroad close to an IIP in a nice workforce area. Uh, so we've got a factory building here in southeastern Tennessee. I think that about covers it. On stuff I have built and blown money on uh, during the last couple months. Policies. Where are we at with that? I think when we last left off, I was working on Militia Act 3, perhaps? No, I think we just shifted to King Cotton. Okay, so King Cotton 2 is complete, so we have more agricultural subsidies coming in, uh, which is good, because I think, uh, well, there's just lots of good uses for those. Uh, after that, we have picked up Government Funding 1 to start a little bit more with the econ uh, economy subsidies. And that also unlocks unlocks a tariff act and impressment, which I can see going for those at some point. The main thing is we have available twelve policies. That's these main items on the red lines that go straight down. Okay, that's the government funding, the King Cotton, the industry, the military, and the diplomacy. I think I kind of want to lock these in, right? But then once we get to 12, well, we got what we got, and that's all we're going to have for policies. But at that point, we've got our maximum subsidies coming in. And at that point, then we'll go back and start picking up acts, like Tariff Act and uh, Impressment... You get the idea. Projects. We've picked up a number of projects uh, in the past couple months. Already mentioned the medium range carbines. And this is only showing the Already picked up the medium range carbines, mentioned that. Uh, got another level in railroad construction. I might actually have picked up two levels in railroad construction, I don't remember. Uh, we're getting very, very close to completing the uh, Texas Railroad and we'll very soon start building that Cumberland Gap Railroad. Uh, I picked up a level of market reform, which, you know, we're kind of going with the market spam strategy and see how good or not good that is and uh, market reform just folds into that dovetails into that subsidized banks would be really attractive if we were able to build if we had more than one bank <laughs> and it were somewhere kind of or even if we just had the one and it were somewhere kind of central but uh, eh I don't know. We're still going to be limited to one bank for some time to come because of where that bank act is in the policy tree. 
Um, now seeing how, I guess, resilient the credit rating is to, you know, <laughs> spendthrift Bram, I don't know that I am as uh, concerned about improved credit rating as I was. So I'm kind of thinking, hey, and there's not much else to spend economy subsidies on. So I'm kind of thinking market reform levels since I'm building a lot of markets. Uh, I did pick up another level of farm mechanization. And I'll probably do one more. And that'll get us to plus 30% volunteer. And that'll probably be enough. And I probably need to build some agricultural buildings once we get to that. Uh, I think I picked up another level of administration reform for faster policies and acts. I could do another one. Well, let's see. Yeah, I don't see any reason not to pick this up right now. I mean, I've kind of gotten what I'm going to get with the railroad construction. We're at five levels. Four levels. <laughs> and I had some... Uh, the, the, the diplomacy filled up. I went ahead and took another level of trade deal. So that's the projects uh, that I've taken since the last um, episode. And what am I looking for next in military? Well, I kind of went big on the 14 pound James, even though these are real, real, real close now. <laughs> I kind of feel like, eh. I've already committed to my rifle gun of the game. I'm not going to get those. Might have been a dumb idea, but that's what I'm doing. I think I probably want to start putting some military subsidies into logistics reforms. Um, trade warfare would be nice may do another recruitment yeah I'm going to do another recruitment I, nah, nah, let, let's just hold off and see how bad April really is first anyway I think that covers projects I already mentioned uh, the increase in support in Kentucky so this is interesting. Um, in the early part of winter, we captured Cincinnati, fought a battle at Lawrenceburg a couple episodes ago, and ever since then, there has not been any combat. No cities have been captured in either direction. Uh, when we captured Cincinnati, before that happened, Union National Morale was at 54. Uh, following our capture of Cincinnati and the Battle of Lawrenceburg, right afterward, Union National Morale dropped to 50. 5-0. Five so Union National Morale has risen from 50 back to 54. So that's interesting. It, typically, National Round doesn't rise that much, uh, especially when things are quiet. I can only think that uh, at some point, the Union must have picked up uh, a policy or project or act that increased national morale. I didn't see any headlines or intel reports that jumped out at me as, uh, as doing that. So... Anyway, you know, mentioned several times earlier uh, in the campaign that there was some concern to keep the campaign going long enough for all this 1.06 stuff uh, for us to learn. And, uh, yeah, things are looking like that's going to happen because their national morale has not continued to drop. It's actually risen. 
Uh, we may or may not be about to have a big manpower problem, which will lengthen the campaign. And that's, I think that's about uh, all I have to say to catch everybody up. Let's roll time a little bit. And I think here in just a few hours, we're going to have a new railroad. Oh, also during that time, uh, our little engineering unit has been running around. Ding, 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 ding. The Houston and Shreveport opens up. Yay. So. Well, where is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, it runs this way. It runs up through Huntsville, Palestine, and uh, Dallas. And then over to Shreveport. I was kind of thinking it was going to run up this way through Nacogdoches. Yeah, that's how that's pronounced. Nacogdoches. In this town, here I go off on a tangent, is pronounced Nacogdoches. And they are both just about equidistant from each other uh, from the Sabine River, which is the border between Louisiana and Texas. And uh, essentially, I think that this area in here, um, the predominant Native American tribe in this area was, it is, uh, the Caddo, C-A-D-D-O. And I think that Louisiana being French and at one time uh, Texas being Spanish and then Mexican, I believe that this word and that word are the Spanish and French kind of renderings of the same Caddo Indian term, uh, word. And the no doubt apocryphal and, and uh, not actually historical, but kind of the legend was, <laughs> is, that the cattle lived in this area right on the river and there was a chief and he had two sons named Nacogdoches and Nacogdoches and he told them you walk three days that way you walk three days that way and then there you will settle and you will raise your own little uh, tribe village uh, there and uh, so, so that's the story I'm, I'm sure that's not true Anyway, Nacogdoches and Nacogdoches. Not showing this map, but right up here where the, the border diverges from the river, right in here, there's a little bitty town right here called Joaquin. Uh, J-O-A-Q-U-I-N uh, in Shelby County, Texas. And that's where my family is from. I did not grow up there. But uh, my parents did. Both of them. Okay, enough about that. It is time to build a new railroad. Let's see how long it's going to take to build this Cumberland Gap Railroad that I've been yammering on about for about 58 episodes. 337 days. All right, off you go. This campaign might very well last that long. <laughs> All right, railroad started building. And a little disappointed that our railroad transport capacity didn't jump up more than it did. We were above 130. Maybe time needs to run a little bit.
Oh, we built some stuff. Stuff that I forgot what I built. So let's see what we got here. Another market. Petersburg. Market at Raleigh. And Mark. Yeah. Earlier, I had kind of built this sprinkled some markets along this kind of central interior corridor through here and I didn't really finish that <laughs> went as far I figured I should actually complete that chain of markets so uh, uh, put a few more markets up in here okay we might be getting close enough that these contract expirations are measured in days rather than uh, I clicked on the wrong one it might be measured in days rather than weeks let's see I'm still saying one month West Virginia militias back up to 13,000 men. Army of the Ohio. Uh, last spotted over a month ago. 15,000. Oh, we built something else. Ah, the factory is done. That's good. Uh, down here. This factory. We should get us making more provisions and some other things. Uniforms is another thing that factories make. I uh, could go ahead and do a farm or a lumber mill or a mill. We have a 45,000 man reserve, which pretty much puts us back into that situation of having plenty of reserves for replacements, for attrition and casualties, not really able to build or recruit any new units at the, in that range, for reasons I've talked about multiple times already. Five thousand there, but that that army has not been spotted since October. run it to April 1st to see what our economy and uh, intel reports say. Depending on how badly all the units in this uh, Eastern Department are really needed. I'm kind of thinking of. I usually ignore Fort Monroe because it doesn't. I've never felt it really hurt anything. But I'm kind of thinking of going down here and taking it in order to give some naval some additional room to maneuver in here and then chasing this blockade fleet away. The frigates that I built are already done. I'm just kind of waiting for that uh, CSS Virginia to be built. But the original idea for those ships was to help keep 
our kind of big three or big four Gulf of Mexico ports uh, open down around Mobile and New Orleans. However, we chased that fleet away already and it does not come back. Those ports remain blockade free. So now I'm kind of thinking of getting rid of this guy. But taking Fort Monroe is probably, if not completely necessary, a, a huge uh, help in doing that. Okay, about to roll over into April now. All right, let's look at the economic report. BBB plus, good. Recovery, wealth, mediocre and increasing. This is actually the second, I didn't show the last one, but uh, our population wealth has been increasing the last two reports. Uh, tax revenues, uh, uh, well, okay, so the wealth is increasing, the recover, the cycle is recovery, yet somehow our tax revenues decrease by almost a million. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, three markets constructed. I built a lot of buildings since the last episode, however, I think they're all complete now. I don't think I'm building anything at the moment. These three markets mentioned here are the three that we just saw that completed. Exports and imports continue to grow. The imbalance remains enormous. Okay, average corporate production is finally starting to show some real numbers. Uh, 6.8 million. That's composed of little piddly numbers in pretty much every econ report before that. And we are lacking machine parts, food, food, that's new, and rice. Yeah, I, I, I probably need to start doing some more agricultural buildings. And we got tons of salt. No surprise there. How about Intel? Ooh. Okay. Okay, so the Union is finally getting, they're finally working on military too. I don't like that, although I am happy that they waited until now, you know. <laughs> but they're going to have more military subsidies soon. And, and they're working on weapon production for their projects. I'm not against that. Still zero with Spain, whatever. Uh, 650 men into five brigades. I just don't think this populates right. It's been showing a few guys getting recruited here and there. And they've raised more fleets. Something on Lake Michigan, and then yet more. They have a stupid number of Massachusetts Bay squadrons. You know, this one is number 14. 15, 16, 17. So purportedly, and they've started 24 more ships. I, I think the AI overbuilt ships, I really do. Because I feel like I build a lot, but not, not remotely as much as this. And I'm talking when I play as Union. Um, no change in the morale. And they have shifted from... <coughs> Excuse me. We'd seen that they had gone several reports. Sorry, that's a post sneeze voice there. <laughs> uh, we had seen where they had gone a, a few intel reports as defensive posture, and now they've shifted back to consolidating and regrouping, which is a pretty clear indicator. Yeah, they're going to start moving again soon. Okay. Okay, now that we're in April, how many days away are we from the big crash? 30 days, all the way to the end of April.
Okay, I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a cut in here, and I'm gonna go through and do all that weapon swapping in all of the uh, brigades that are about to expire, so that we don't inadvertently lose a whole bunch of rifles when that happens. Um, and then I'll come back and we'll fast forward time until the big manpower drop. And we'll see just how big that, big that drop is at the end of this episode. Okay, so I went through all the armies and every 12-month unit that is coming due to expire, not just at the end of April, but for the rest of the summer, is now equipped with mixed muskets or some Springfield muskets. Uh, six-pounder field guns in the case of artillery and mixed cavalry weapons in the case of calf which means I hope we don't have a battle <laughs> during April <laughs> because it won't go so hot um, but we got a whole bunch of uh, rifles in the army now about almost 30,000 Mississippis, which we definitely did not start the campaign with. And some of that is growth of brigades over time, but a lot of that is captured as well. Uh, okay. And I had forgotten to mention earlier, we were working on Industrialization 3, and that is complete. So, where to next on the policies... And what I could do, I could go ahead. I could go ahead and take the conscription act as a just in case, and it'll be ready in time for. You know, so it'll be ready to go. But I can go through and I can set all the units to volunteers only at least in the field armies, so that we're not using a lot of draft units and combat units, but it's there if we need it, without having to wait the month for it to enact. And I think we'll still get the benefit of the replacement's speed plus I'm not going to do that yet. <laughs> I'm going to go government funding too. Get more econ subsidies coming in, which feeds into our market reforms. See there, our credit rating is bumped back up to A-. minus. From BBB Plus. I'm going to hazard going to a little bit faster time compression. See what kind of projects we got. Scanning down. Okay. There's a whole bunch of military ones. I'm kind of holding fire on. Uh... No, I'm going to go ahead and take the uh, recruitment offices. Tempted to take trade warfare. I've noticed this a couple times off camera, but I haven't really pointed it out. Despite all those billions of squadrons apparently up here somewhere off Massachusetts, none of them have come to screw with our 
little blockade fleet, which is only blocking these ports to uh, now 19%. Right? Meanwhile, we've got 14 of our ports blockaded. Check this out. We have done far more damage with our blockade than they have done with theirs. 58 million from our blockade of them, 13 million from their blockade <laughs> of, of our ports. And the trade warfare slider is heavily in our favor. I gotta think something's not quite right about that, but okay. <laughs> So, there you go. For a few little steamers, man, they're having an outsized effect. That's something worth doing in every CSA campaign, I think. Alright. Time rolling. Mexico stuff, blah, blah, blah. Now, we're actually out of winter now. <laughs> I just don't want to do anything until I... Oh, can it finally be? Really? I didn't think this day would come. No, it's not! It's free... Jones? Okay, so Jones is back. <sighs> you know who's not back? Let's look at the officers here. Yeah, this guy... Stonewall Jackson was, was wounded, like, back in July of last year. He is still wounded, malingerer. April 14th, the moment of truth is approaching. And before these guys actually go away, as I said, uh, most of them are, well, all of them are armed with smoothbores. So let's just take note of... just how many mixed muskets 44,000 it was up at 100,000 before I did the big swap 44,000 mixed a lot of them have Springfield muskets 36,000 of those in armory uh, pretty much all the calf <laughs> have mixed cavalry weapons and I of course most of them just had them anyway and all the short-term artillery are on six pounder field guns So when all these units disperse, we'll come back and see what our levels are. And we should see a huge jump in all four of those categories. If we do, that means, yeah, when units contract expires, the balance, when the unit shrinks, do go back to the armory, as they should. <laughs> and so that's good. Or if we don't see a jump, then we know, okay. When units are about to expire their contracts, you need to pull the good weapons out. Even if it's a decent reenlistment ratio, right? Because that would still be a thousand or twelve hundred in, in a big unit. That would, you know, if they have like a fifty percent reenlistment rate, as they should, that's still like a thousand or twelve hundred, uh, almost fifteen hundred in some cases, uh, rifles. So that's worth knowing. We'll see what happens. So 
something may kind of escape my attention, but I want to go ahead and accelerate time because I do want to see the end of April before the end of this episode. And I think we're getting pretty close to an hour. If not, they're already. All in the name of science. Figuring out the update. In a normal campaign, I would already be moving armies and kicking butt and all that sort of thing. Virginia down to 79%. Kentucky up to 69%. How's Missouri doing? Surrey's hanging steady at 70%. No, I don't see the Union moving either. In any... Any theater. Well, these cores over here are getting pretty big, too, from gradual replacements just before they collapse. So we're up to 232k. Oh, and we are projected. To, so these are later in the summer, are now coming into that three month window, projected to lose 83,000 men over the next three months. Whew. Now that number doesn't count re enlistments. Or at least I don't think it ever has. So that would be, okay, that just, just took a big drop there. Yeah, because we're on May 2nd. Okay, let's see what the damage was. Ramser, how many men you got? 1775. Now, the reenlistment ratio is up, but 17% is still way low. Even at 17%, Ramser would have far, far fewer. He was at about 2850, 20, maybe 2900 by the time that uh, the contracts expired. So. Even at 17%, he would have something like 500 to 600 troops now. At the 3% that we saw just a couple weeks ago, he'd have like 100 dudes. If that, like 80 guys. He doesn't. He's got, so, he's got almost 1,800 men. This is still a viable combat unit. Oh, that, that is a relief. So what that's telling me is this reenlistment ratio displayed in the tooltip for me in this campaign is just plain wrong. That I'm really getting about a 50%-ish reenlistment rate as I should. Okay. Well that question answered and i can stop all my worry warding and hand wringing and i think i'll be able to slide by without taking that damn conscription act for a while i'm feeling pretty good about that and i think that that is an appropriate place to bring an end to this episode because i got a lot of more off-camera crap to do to farm weapons back out and you know and i got a bunch of units sitting in the uh, replacement because i didn't quite know what to do with them i didn't know whether to form new cores with them or if i was going to need those brigades to just transfer them directly into existing cores uh so i, I got a lot of army tinkering to do and then when we come back for the next episode, no. 
I believe we'll be able to do some campaigning and, uh, you know, let's get the Federals kicked out of Virginia. Hey, so I had finished recording the episode and I was in the middle of editing and realized that I had forgotten to look at our weapons stocks to see if all of those freed up weapons actually went back into the armory or disappeared into the ether. So let's have a look. We had... 44,000 mixed muskets and now have... 557,000. Uh, we had 36,000 Springfield muskets and now have 42,000. We had 584 mixed calf, which we still have exactly, but I think that is because we started the campaign with zero cavalry. Even that one little tiny 300-man unit, I think, had something else, like Springfield Musketoons or something. So none of the short-term cavalry have actually expired just yet. they still got a few more weeks. And the six-pounder field guns, yeah. We were down to 60, and we're back up to 93. So, there we have it. Whenever the contracts expire... The surplus guns in the smaller unit do go back to the army as they should. That is good to know. Okay. If you like what we're doing with the channel, like the content, uh, then leave a like, leave a comment, perhaps even subscribe if you are so inclined. But at any rate, thank you very, very much for watching. I appreciate it.